I believe this morning. I'm going to take a short and some of Exodus to show you that when the Lord said a false balance was an abomination to him, he must not have been talking about himself. <laughs> and the Lord's a strange book. Now, Exodus, I'm going to talk about the most unglamorous, non glamorous most dull, uninteresting subject you ever read in your life. And then show you how it's connected with your salvation and the first and second coming of Christ, including Christ's birthday and the date of the second advent. That's in a book nobody's going to pay attention to. It's back in the Old Testament. Now, if you ever try to read your Bible through from kiver to kiver, you notice when you got to Exodus, how you kind of bogged down? Remember, you got to have silver taxes and loops of the salvage of the coupling in the golden socket for the drag that thing got to be? Yeah. I'm a lot of Bible dull as much. Really? I mean, really? Boy, you're getting through Chronicles. First Chronicles. Boy, you talk about nothing. That's, that's it. And I used to wonder about that, why that was. I saw one time he said, the Israel is the glory of all lands, a land the Lord God cares for. His eyes are upon the beginning of the year, the end of the year. It's not the glory of all lands, that place is goat pasture. You ever been to Austria? You haven't seen nothing, you've seen Austria. Austria put the Grand Canyon and the Painted Desert out of business. I've seen the rainbow over the poly in Hawaii and cut bamboo up there and correct it over the goose. And I've seen Fujiyama in the winter. Why, like Palestine, the glory of all lands. I did not got any rivers like the Missouri and the Mississippi. They didn't got any mountains like the up Mount Mitchell over here and up in Alaska. There's nothing about country. I don't even want to look at it. Why did God bring about it? You ever read through your Bible and find it where Ruth bought her mother, you know, an ephah of barley? What's that got to do with anything? So some woman bought her mother-in-law some grain. <laughs> you know, glory, hallelujah, bless God, oh my soul, what a verse. <laughs> One kid at Bob Jones said his favorite verse was at Par Bar Westward forth the causeway to a Par Bar. And somebody said, that isn't in there. And it was, it was the first conference. My life verse. At Par Bar Westward, forth the causeway to at Par Bar. Don't you get a blessing out of that? <laughs> Boy, it's nonsense. Now, that Bible's filled with that kind of stuff. It's deceptive. It'll make you think there's nothing to it. But then, one day it occurred to me why I know why I finally found why it was. You know, the reason why God makes somebody and bust about that land is that that land belongs to his son. And that land killed his son, and his son's going to come back to that land and reign his king over that land. That's why he said it's the glory of all lands. And I learned something. I learned if you want to get along with God, brag about his son. Because that's what a man's interested in. He's interested in his son, especially his firstborn. So God, you know what God does in this book? He emphasizes everything connected with his son. And the world doesn't want that. So what you find here is an emphasize out in the world. But it's emphasized here. Now here's a dirty gray tent. This tent, your tent here would look like a gym alongside this one. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, talking to the children of Israel. And let them make me a sanctuary. 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. According to all the pattern which I will show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it, a tabernacle. Now there are 14 chapters about that tent, that gray, dirty, gray tent out there in the wilderness. Inside of it's beautiful, it had gold and silver inside, a lot of embroidery work and a lot of things. Uh, and, but outside, it was a gray tent in the wilderness. There are 14 chapters on that dirty gray tent. There's one on the creation of the universe. Isn't that a pretty rotten balance, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I mean, you're interested in Mars and Venus and Jupiter and outer space travel and the Star Wars and Star Trek and all this junk. How come God only gave one chapter in the book and gave 14 to a dirty gray tent? You reckon right the Lord knows what he's doing? Well, he must, but that's a, some way to go about it, wouldn't you think? <laughs> now, there's a catch here. Here's the catch. Verse 8. I want the tabernacle so I can dwell with them. The question is how to get God with you. That's the question. If you can get where God is, you'll never die. Did you know when Jesus walked up and down this earth, nobody could die when he was around? And uh, 
Martha said, uh, she said, if, if uh, you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You know why she knew that? Because nobody ever died in his presence. Now, a lot of times he'd show up when somebody was dead, like the widow of Nain's son or Lazarus, and bring him back, or Jarius' daughter. But not once do you find anybody dying when Christ is alive in their presence. Now, if you just get where Christ is, <clears throat> you'd have eternal life. You would never die. And he says, I want that sanctuary so I can dwell with them. That was the idea behind that thing. So what does it do? It shows up in the last book in your Bible, Revelation 21. That tabernacle shows up in Revelation 21. Look at it. Revelation 21, verse. That tabernacle goes from there to there. The second book in the Bible is the last book in the Bible. Well, the last thing God says in that Bible for the last chapter is a tabernacle. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And look what you get in that tabernacle. You're dwelling with him, he's dwelling with you. And what happens? No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. Ain't that pretty good? Amen. I guess that is. You know, all this what earth wants, it wants that. Save the laws. You want to get in a place where you never hurt, and you never cry, and you never die. That's what you want. You better have minutes, you old cook, but that's what you want. <laughs> you want to, you, that's why you try to stay alive. That's why you feed your face so you don't kick the bucket. What you want to get in a place where you don't ever die, and no pain, and no crying, and no death, and everything's just perfect. You want it to end happily ever after, and it does. It does with the tabernacle. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he'll dwell among them. So that tabernacle is something. First of all, it pictures God dwelling with a man. Now, in this, in this generation you live in, in our age, you know what it is. What? No, you're not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost that you have of God. You're not your own. Christ in you, because he said, I'll come and dwell in them, and they shall be alive. People, and I'll be their God. The dwelling place of God in this age is your body. Not a tabernacle, not a temple, not a church building. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that temple is the word for tabernacle. Very used interchangeably. Let me show you the meaning. From the first Samuel. And this this kind of stuff drives scholars up the wall. That's why they keep changing their Bible, they're stupid. First Samuel chapter one. Here's Eli. And what's he doing in First Samuel chapter one? Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, he's sitting out there by the, by the, te uh, by the temple. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. See temple? You see temple? There wasn't any temple there. Who built the temple? Why, well, Solomon isn't even around here. He hadn't been born. Why does he say temple? See? Now, you know what a scholar does when he hits that? Well, there must be a mistake here. This word in the Hebrew actually means, yeah, uh, blow it out your nose, too. It means just what it says. So how do you know? Turn to Acts 15. Scripture is scripture. Scripture is scripture. Sola scriptura, Luther says. Scripture only. The scriptures interpret themselves. The best interpreter of scripture is scripture. Acts 15, New Testament, after the resurrection. Acts 15, verse 13. Acts 15, 13. While you read where Eli, back in 1 Samuel, opened the doors of the temple in the morning. And there wasn't any temple there. It was a door to a tent. Acts chapter 15, verse uh, 15. Well, we could make it 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name, Acts 10. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle, the tabernacle of David that has fallen and built upon the ruins thereof. That's the temple. The temple was destroyed. You know what it's called there? It's called a tabernacle. We call it tabernacle because before Solomon built that thing, David bought the Ark of the Covenant and pitched the tabernacle for it outside Jerusalem and they bought the Ark up and put it in the temple. So they used it enormously. Now, stop and think. You know what that means? That means the rebuilt temple could be just a tent. Which means you wouldn't have to get rid of the Master Omar. 
You can put up a tent in 24 hours. Now think about that. You don't have to have three and a half years to build that temple. It can be a tabernacle. That's what it's called. The temple and the tent and the tabernacle are used synonymously. the same thing in here. But you only get that note from a King James 1611 authorized version. You can't get that in the Hebrew or the Greek. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> All right, uh, First Kings. That's what they love about me. First Kings. First Kings. And we'll get First Kings chapter 8. Solomon's going to build the temple. You see what he got back here. I've got the creation of the universe back here. It's a tabernacle job. What he got over here? I got something over here to show you that there isn't a college educated person in Ohio that knows the number of the months. During more than own months. People in America call this here the first month, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And of course that's nonsense. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Eight, nine, there's seven. Sept. Septuagint, seventy. Sept, sept. One of those trades, quattro, cinco, six, sept, siete, sept, ocho. Einstein, dry, three, four, six, even oct, oct, eight. In any language. Novena, nine. November, December, decimal, ten. That's the seventh, that's the eighth, that's the ninth, that's the tenth. In any language. Whether the PhD in Ohio knows that. You see why? Because they're stupid. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you because you have that education. I'm making fun of the fellows who have the education. If I had this tent this morning, the faculty and the staff of Yale, Oxford, Edinburgh, Heidelberg, Stuttgart, and Yale, and Harvard, and uh, Dartmouth, and Princeton, and University of Southern California in Chicago and Bob Jones in Tennessee Temple and Piedmont and Pillsbury and Fuller Seminary. I'd spit on that bunch one time and drown the whole bunch. And it wouldn't keep me awake. And if you don't believe it, I ask them. First Kings chapter 8. Amen, amen, amen. Out of the mouths of bait and suckling, but that's perfected praise. First Kings uh, 8, verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the head of the tribe, the chief of the fathers, so forth and so on. Verse 2. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ephanim, which is the seventh month. The seventh month. Verse 4. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle. So he brought it up. And they put it, verse 6, in the temple. That's why this given us anonymously. Seventh month. What's the seventh month for a Jew? First month, Abib, between March and April. Second month, between April and May. Third month, between May and June. Get down here, uh, the fifth month, between uh, August and September. Uh, 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 August, uh, 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 July and August. Sixth month, between uh, uh, September and October. Seventh month here, sitting here between October and November. No, eighth month, October, November. Seventh month between September and October in here. Seventh month. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Seven, eight, nine, ten. You got a Jewish calendar. Gentiles go by a Jewish calendar. What you call here the, the uh, tenth month, tenth day here, uh, at, uh, seven, eight, nine, and ten is actually is actually seven, eight, nine, and ten. It's Jewish. You're going as if this were the first month, March and April. That's the Passover. Oh, now here comes this thing up in the seventh month. Why does he make it the seventh month? Take your Bible, John Leviticus chapter twenty-three. Now you see what I'm doing to you? Make it twenty. Make it be a twenty-three. You see what I'm doing to you? I'm running you Genesis to Revelation. I'm going to run you Matthew to First Peter. Run you Exodus to Numbers. Numbers to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy to Nehemiah. Nehemiah back to Numbers. Numbers over to the Psalms. When I get through, I'll have the first advent of Christ, the second advent of Christ, and how the universe is set up. <coughs> scripture to Scripture. Our right, Leviticus chapter twenty-three, verse thirty-four. Remember the seventh month. All right, Leviticus 23, 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month 
shall be underlined. The Feast of Tabernacles. Seventh month. Now you drop that. That's September, October in the Jewish calendar. On American calendar, it's September. Sept. Seven. The seventh month. The Feast of Tabernacles takes place. What are you doing the Feast of Tabernacles? Verse uh, 42. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. What are they made of? Verse 40. Goodly trees, palm trees, boughs, willows. Uh, make a brush arbor. A brush arbor to keep that Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. A brush arbor called a booth. B-O-O-T-H-S. Do you have any fair up here in Canton, Ohio in the, in the fall? Don't they rent out booths? You see, you have to follow the King James. In fact, you don't believe it's immaterial. You have to follow it. They put up booths in September at the fair. Because that's what the Lord said to do at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, they don't know that. But this book runs the world. And the fact this world doesn't believe this book is absolutely immaterial. If you got drunk last night, I hope you didn't, but if you're out of you know, a beer house, went out and swept down some Miller High Life or asked me to give me a light and all that kind of stuff, if you did, did you know where the word came from? Find me a beer head in this town that can tell you where the word beer came from. You know, it's Numbers 21 in the King James Bible, and the word's talking about a well of water, like beer sheep. B W E R, but a, but a drunk don't know that. In front of this book, will tell you what time to get up, what time to go to bed, and the fact that you don't read it or believe it doesn't mean anything in this earth, except you're just short of information. That's all it means. Seventh month, September, October. All right, down to the planetarium. They're heliocentric. They say the sun's in the middle, and the earth goes around the sun. I'm not sure about that. Me neither. <laughs> uh, I'm skeptical of skepticism. Maybe it's geocentric. Maybe they're standing still and the sun's going around. I don't have enough to prove either way, but I'll take their way, you know, to prove them wrong. And you do, that way it's just wrong no matter whether it's right or not. <laughs> and here's, here's the sun sitting here, and here's the earth going around the sun. But the winter solstice up here, that's the longest night in the year, and that's the shortest night in the year. And in the winter, the, you're further away from the sun than you are in the summer. You say, why is it cold in the winter then? Because the earth is tilted away. It's tilted up there, away from the sun in the winter. So when it's winter up here, it's summer down there at the end of South America and Australia. The, the seasons are different. And now it's 90 million miles from there to there. But here's the, here goes the earth around here like this. And when it gets there, it's 90 million miles from here. Now, when the Earth gets around here, it's 94 million miles. They say, I'll take their word for it. But the thing they don't want to talk to you about is what I drew. You see, the, Earth, the Sun's not in the center. By the laws of gravitation, it should be right in the middle. But it ain't. So the laws of gravitation are no good. It should be right there. Why would it be lopsided? It is lopsided. Now, if you have this meeting here, you contact some smart aleck here in town who, who's a planetarian in astronomy and physics, and for God's sake, don't tell them when you go to church. They'll frighten him to death. <laughs> and for goodness sake, don't bring them my name in it. Just I ask, just like this, act like a nice, stupid, innocent inquirer, uh, is, is, the, is the sun right in the middle of an Earth's orbit, or is it a little off-center? And you'll tell it's off-center if you're an honest man. They all know it's four days off-center. Why is it all four days off center? Well, I know. Turn to Genesis. <laughs> you can't tell you're out of Bible clean up the college education. Genesis chapter 1, verse 19. And this was Schofield blew it. He couldn't even handle this one. he got a good Bible. If you've got a Schofield reference Bible, oh, well, you got the best reference Bible there is. But every now and then, his education gets the best of him, and he... Once or twice, not much, about eight times in about 30,000 verses. That's pretty good bad All right, Genesis 1, verse 19. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. And what did God make on the fourth day? Verse 16. 
He made the sun the fourth day and the moon. See that thing? On the fourth day. Now who believes that? Nobody. Henry Morris doesn't believe. Schofield doesn't believe. Who believes the earth was here before the sun? You know that any case person that does. Except Ruckman, he's crazy. <laughs> I believe the earth was here before the sun. You say, why? Because that's what it says. Got a Schofield note? And the margin says it was there all the time and just began to function the fourth day. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. Change by the word of God to make people think you're smart. Now those four days are September 20, 21, 22, and 23. So by our calendar, that thing there is the date of the Feast of Tabernacles. You say, why? Turn to Psalm 19, Scripture to Scripture. Never mind modern science, they're so far behind, they'll never catch up with the book. No way in the world. You don't go back to the Bible, brethren, you try to catch up with it. Psalm 19, verse 1. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. There it is. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day are his speech. Talk, <coughs> preaching. Right now, the Lord's preaching. Day unto day. How's he preaching? Well, the sun come up in the east. Where's that over here? Is that over here? Oh, I went west. Which way is the earth going? West, east. It's going against the sun. I said, it's going against the sun. S-U-N-S-O-N. -S if you're going with the world, you're going against the sun. Why is that? Because the sun's a type of Christ. How do you know that? He's called that in Malachi 4. On you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, S-U-N, with healing in his wings. Christ. That's why people are sun worshippers. The nearest thing you can get to deity on this physical is the sun. Now why is that true? Because the sun's a trinity. The sun has heat rays. You can feel them, but you can't see them. Type of the Holy Spirit. It has light rays. You can see them, but you can't feel them. Type of Jesus Christ. You to see me as see the Father. It has actinic rays, and you can't see them, and you can't feel them, and no man has seen God at any time. The sun's a picture of the Trinity. So it goes against the world. A Christian says, well, I'm not against Christ. You are if you're standing still. If you're standing still, the earth is rotating against the sun. You're, you're against Christ unless you're moving forward with it. Go east to west. That's why history goes that way. We won't talk about that right now. All right, verse 3. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Whose voice? Day and night. Night preaches. What comes up at night? The moon comes up. What's it a picture of? Song of Solomon, Bride of Christ. Who is she that shines forth fair as the sun, clear as the moon? Second advent, terrible on with banner, banners on the get. The whole thing's there. What does the moon does? It reflects the light of the sun. That's the body of Christ, the church. What is the moon? It's a dead planet. You're dead and your life is hidden. It's all there. It's all there. There's nothing missing. Then when you, when every day, every heathen in the world knows about the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the bride of Christ. Every day. Sun comes up over there, blood red, second advent. He cometh from Eden with thy garments from Bozah. Why is your apparel red like he the second, second advent? Sun coming up in the morning. What's this dispensation? Night? Night? Uh, behold, come as a thief in the night. You know what watch he's going to come? He's coming in the morning watch over here. That's why those two stones out in the, in the graveyard face east. Now, the undertaker don't know that. But that book tells you what to do. All those folks in that graveyard are waiting for Christ to show up, including the ones that are in hell, because he turned that gravestone facing east. You see what I mean, Billy Bean? <laughs> They say they don't do that in a Jewish graveyard, and then maybe some graveyards they don't follow that practice, but they follow that practice in America for 300 years. The tabloid faces east. What you doing? You waiting for the sun to come up. I'll meet you in the morning. <laughs> How does the sun die at night in the west? You know, because that cowboy said he's going west. Die. How does the sun die in the west? Blood red. Just like blood. So the scientists said, well, it's the dirt particle of the atmosphere. Sure, we know, kid. Suck your bottle. All right, verse 4. Verse 4. 
Their line is going out through all the earth. Their words, W-R-D-S, they preach. Day and night preach. Words. You don't have to know the language. Words to the end of the world. In them hath he said, look out, a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, which is as a bridegroom. Who would that be? Well, you know who that is. If Christ, a bridegroom, coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. Second Advent. All right, um, uh, Matthew 17. Anywhere in the book, this old dirty gray tent shows up. And boy, you talk about a key to something. Matthew 17. It'll tell you how long Christ's ministry lasted, and it'll tell you the day he died on. It'll tell you, it'll tell you the day he was born on. He isn't born December 25th. He's born September 23rd. That's why the shepherds are out in the field keeping the flocks by night. <coughs> but I'm not going to change anything. I mean, we still sing Christmas carols at Christmas time. Of course, we sing them in September too. That upsets folks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, brother, you know, some of you, not a lot of you, but some of you are going to be try to get so scriptural you're unscriptural. And pretty soon, are you? Are, uh, you, 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 some pastor thinks it's a sin to have an Easter egg hunt. I don't know if your pastor thinks that or not, but uh, some of them think it is. And some of them think it's a sin to have a Christmas tree, something like that. And I, I'm, I'm very pig, and I don't, I don't fool that stuff. I, don't, I can't see out a bunch of kids with Easter bunnies and hunting Easter eggs and worship the Babylonian goddess Nimrod and all that stuff. And so I don't, I let them, I let them, you know, enjoy Easter. And say Merry Christmas, I tell them Santa Claus comes down the chimney and all that stuff, you know. They won't know, well, what happens when I see he burns his britches every time he comes down. <laughs> I tell my kids, Jesus Christ gives them the presents, that kind of stuff. So I don't be observing Christmas. Sure you do, it's a national holiday. Look into that stuff. You deserve it, whether you want to or not. You don't go to work. <laughs> um, some of the brethren get so hyper-separated, so hyper-dedicated, uh, they're, they're unscriptural. Well, I just go over the book. No, you don't. You drove a car here this morning. Some cars in the Bible? Any toilet paper in the Bible? <laughs> Any commodes in the Bible? You don't go just for the Bible. Of course you don't. I didn't see you come this morning to church on a camel or a mule. I don't get you to eat bread every day. Maybe it's the scripture of the non-scriptural. So the church is all in the house. It wasn't a church building. That's right. Who wants to host this bunch next Sunday? Who want, uh, somebody here volunteer to have this bunch in their house next Sunday morning? See how stupid that is? You get the scripture and you're not all the dying. <laughs> Most of you aren't going to be troubled with that. All right, Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. After 6,000 years, oh, excuse me, six days, <laughs> Jesus taketh them up, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the S U N, and as radiant white as light. And behold, there appeared named Moses and Elijah. Two of those, those are the last two names in the Old Testament, Malachi 4. The last two fellows mentioned are Moses and Elijah. And right above them it says, The Son of Righteousness shall arise with evening in his wings. Then said Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If I will, let us make here three tabernacles. Tabernacles. Second advent. One for thee and one for Moses, one for Elijah. How do you know the second coming? Look at 1628. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And about six days later, there it is. Peace of tabernacles. That's why he says, let us build three tabernacles. Why? They were supposed to build those booths on the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's build three of them. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the Lord said, Moses and Elijah are good, but this is my beloved son herein. Christ, the fulfillment of the law and Moses and the prophets. All right, uh, back in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14. Now we know the date of the second advent. The day of the second advent is the 23rd of September. I'm not talking about the rapture. I don't know when the rapture is. I'm not giving you the year of the advent. I don't know what the year is. 
if our counter is right, the Lord would have come back two years ago. So obviously our counter is something wrong with it. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 14. In Zechariah 14, when he does come back, look at the look at the context. Look at verse 4. You see verse 4? Zechariah 14, 4. Right near the end of the Old Testament, boy. And the next the last book of the Old Testament. Get the New Testament, cut the back to the left. There's two books right there. Zechariah 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Mount of Olives, verse 4. When does this take place? Verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. From that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. What happens? Verse 16. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem, they shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. That marks the second coming. The Passover marks the first, tabernacles marks the second. Verse 17. It will come to pass that those who will not come up of all the families of the earth of Jerusalem and worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not up, they have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the even that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. There shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. At some great tent, it? it marks the second advent and it marks the first advent. Now in your Bible you get reading along Luke chapter 3 and what you found. Jesus was about 30 years old, he says. About 30 years old when John the Baptist baptized him. He said about because he wasn't quite 30 yet. And right in there, before Christ starts his public ministry, he's up in the wilderness, tempted by the devil 40 days and 40 nights. And when he comes down off there, he says, the kingdom of God's at hand, and his ministry starts. Tabernacles. How do you know that? Because there are four Passovers mentioned in John, and Jesus Christ is the fourth Passover lamb right there, which is means, means his ministry went one, two, three, and a half years. There's tabernacles, there's tabernacles, there's tabernacles, there's tabernacles. One year, two years, three years, and a half year, 42 months, three and a half years. So he's crucified in the Passover, which means he's born on the Feast of Tabernacles and begins his ministry at Tabernacles. And before he begins his ministry, John baptizes him, so it said he was about 30 years old. He was 30 there, he was 31 there, he was 32 there, and he was 33 and a half there, like that. So that set up, the universe is set up to commemorate his first and second advent. I bet Muhammad never did that, did <laughs> The universe, when it was made, was made to give you the date of both advents. Which means if you took all your Bible and just ripped it out, all you have is Genesis 1, you'd have all you need. And because in Genesis 1 is the creation, like the first time you're born, the ruin, without form and void, the new birth, recreated, and barren fruit as a Christian, and we see that this time, the whole thing is in the first chapter. Just like that. And where could you find a book like that? You hadn't got one. The country made books in the Library of Congress, not a one of them could come, could touch this thing, couldn't come near it. All right, uh, let's go back to, we don't have time, we'll close here. I've got about eight verses to go, we'll close here with this couple. Come back to 1 Kings where Solomon built the temple, and let's see when he built it, and when he dedicated it. Uh, 1 Kings, 1 Kings, chapter, 1 Kings, chapter, oh, 1 Kings, Chapter 8, something new, like a new heaven and a new earth. Chapter 8. Now here's the dedication of the temple. 1 Kings chapter 8. When is it? <coughs> Verse 3, the seventh month. What is it? Verse 4, tabernacle. Feast of tabernacles when that thing is dedicated. How is it dedicated? It's dedicated according to your King James 66 verses. How many books are in your Bible? What happens in the last chapter, the last book? There's a new heaven and a new earth on the eighth day. One day the Lord's a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. All right? B.C. 1, B.C. 2, B.C. 3, B.C. 4. Crucifixion. 
A.D. out of Domini 1, A.D. out of Domini 2, and this last one here is a Sabbath of rest. One day the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. 4,000 B.C., 3,000 B.C., 2,000 B.C., 1,000 B.C. 1,000 A.D., 2,000 A.D., Advent, Millennium, rest. Six days and rested the seventh day. Verse 6 to 6. On the eighth day, that'd be over here. What's that? That's Revelation chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth. That's the eighth day. The thing around the 7,000, the last one the Sabbath, and the next one the new heaven and the new earth. In what book? The 66th book. And you are in verse 66 in the King James, and it says, On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king and went in their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness the Lord had done for David, his servant, and for Israel, his people. It ends happily ever after, on the eighth day. Picture Revelation 21. Now, who put those verse markings in there? Not a strange business. Some of us did a ride on horseback and just guess for the work. He sure had a good guess, didn't he? One more. Get Isaiah, book of Isaiah. Get Isaiah and get chapter 66. And then get chapter 40. How many books in the Old Testament, folks? 39. Okay, what's the name of the first book in the New Testament? What number would that be? That's 40. I'll take Isaiah and I'll split him at verse 40, or chapter 40. I'll put him, I'll slip in chapter 40, and I'll, I'll put him to him in chapter 66. What happens in chapter 40? You'd never guess. Look at verse 3 and tell me what's going on in verse 3. Watch John the Baptist in Matthew, chapter 40. He's telling you when the 40th book is written, John the Baptist is going to show up. Whoever wrote these books knew what's going to happen before they took place, and somebody accidentally put in the numbers so they match. You know what happens in chapter 66? Look at it. Verse 22. Look at that, man. That's Revelation. Whoever wrote Isaiah knew how many books are going to be in the Bible before it was finished. Now, how do you figure that? You don't. Uh, if you've got, tell you what it's worth, I mean, they got all kind of opinions. I've got a book a day since I was 10 years old, not counting over 150 through that Bible. And I'm telling you right now, that book that you've got there in your lap is the hottest thing you'll ever have your hands on or ever will, because that book has to be written by somebody who's already seen what took place. Whoever's writing that book is up ahead of you at least a thousand years, writing backwards. Whoever wrote that book has only seen you go home to heaven. But don't you understand how God isn't too sympathetic with us sometimes when we have our troubles? We're moaning and groaning as far as God is concerned. You ain't got no troubles. <laughs> because whoever wrote that book said you were up there with him where there was no crying and no pain. He's seen that. That's why he wrote it. So whoever wrote that book, it can't be a man. A man can push the pen, but my God, you can't do that. What they did in that book, all that stuff in detail. Whoever wrote that book is sitting way up ahead of you someplace and writing backwards. That's why they call it holy. It's, it's hot. It'll burn your fingers. I'll give you one example, then we'll have to quit. I moved for a while. I'm back in Exodus. The Lord said, I got a job for you. So what's that? He said, he said, go out there and tell these Jews to do this and that and the other thing about this Passover lamb. And Moses said, what do I tell them to do? The Lord said, well, you get you some blood, and you should put blood on this side of the doorpost here, and get you some on the side of the doorpost there, and the lintel above the doorpost, like that. And Moses said, what for? And Moses said, just shut up. And the Lord said, shut up and do it. Never mind what for. Right. Right. Well, how come you're not going to put the blood in the middle of the door? It's none of your business. I want some over there and some over there and some over there. He starts to write, well, I don't see any sense of wasting the blood that's going to protect me. Why don't I put it on the doorstep? Look, Moses, just shut up and write what it tell you to write. I don't understand. You don't have to understand. It's stupid. Just write. And he writes. Question. Could he have known what he was writing about? 
No way in a God does. He's putting one thief over here and one thief over there. And because God's Son is not an ordinary sinner, He's put them on top. That's right. Yeah. Don't tell me Moses could have known that. So what you want to remember you got that book is you got your hot article. Hold up your Bible now. Hold it up there. Let me see it. Hold it up there. And you see that thing? That's the best thing you had in your hand all day long. Amen. And that's the best thing you have in your hand when the sun goes down. Right. And if you want to know what's wrong in this country among 25 other things, the thing is the preachers that quit preaching this book and teaching this book. Sir. And a lot of the ones that have it and believe it are not given the whole counsel. And everything in the world has taken the place in the Christian life of this book that can right. possibly take its place. Now you leave a place in your life, Christian life, for this book, and boy, you show sure better leave it for this book. Because this book is not written by ordinary men. The ordinary, the men writing this book are pushing a pen, see, or a stencil, or something, or pushing this around a writing instrument, but they don't know what they're writing. Whoever's writing this book is way out there ahead of you. And someday you're going to see it. Yeah. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Okay, brother, come ahead.